Uh, thank you for joining us today, uh, Mr. Almayina. Can you um, give us a sense of, uh, in broad terms, some of the main domestic challenges facing the National Transformation Program of Saudi Arabia? I will think I will start is the main challenge would be societal development, how mm -hmm. society is going to progress within the framework of what is happening around us. So the challenge is first to find out what are your main issues and prioritize them. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the first thing would be the youth, uh, job, jobs for them, women's participation. Another thing is um, uh, that is very important for all of us is the environment, mm. uh, the threat of water scarcity. We don't speak much about it, but most of our water comes from desalination plants. Mm. And in this stage of warfare and viruses and computers and all, this is to me is very important. Mm. The other, uh, the, the topping all this would be the lower oil prices. Yeah. So what we have to do now, the challenge is to have fiscal responsibility and good governance. Mm. Saudi Arabia faces an array of challenges, uh, both uh, internal and uh, international challenges, you know, coming from within and from without. Um, even though the N NTP is a, a very ambitious program, is it sufficient uh, to meet the challenges? I mean, can, is, or is, it, is there still going to be a tremendous amount left to be done? And, and if so, what, what what beyond this plan needs to be tackled? I, I suppose that's what I'm really getting at. I think the challenges are many, uh, and, and to go beyond this is we have to realize not at 2030, what is after that. I think yeah. the main thing too also is the rising uh, population numbers. Mm. This is very important. And before, when you spoke about population curbs or control, you would be attacked by the religious stick and mm. saying this is haram and this is a sin and all. This is very important for Saudi foreign uh, for policy makers, mm. domestic pol uh, policy makers, to look into this uh, you know, societal challenge. Mm. The one thing that the national program that has happened in uh, 2030 also should not overlook the political process mm. and the economic process and mm. the stakeholders and the participation by people. It is not a company. It is a country right. with society. Mm. Uh, there is uh, a lot of social change that is seems built into the transformation program that's implicit rather than explicit, but that will have to emerge in the course of the uh, development if, if the economic goals are to be met. Uh, for example, the integration of women uh, more into society, into the market, into the economic life of the country, etc. Um, it's to be expected, I suppose, that there's uh, socially conservative forces that would resist those kinds of uh, dramatic changes. Um, do we anticipate considerable pushback? And if so, uh, how do you think that's uh, going to be addressed and overcome? One of the uh, two uh, sides has to blink. Mm. It's a Mexican standoff. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, I always am reminded when they talk about these things, the Saudi king or the Saudi authorities, it's like Gary Cooper in high noon. <laughs> and, and this is, the, you have to come out because uh, if we have to attain our goals or partially some of the goals, I think it's very important for us to, to really deface all what has been happening in the name of religion, mm. what has been happening in the face of conservatism, and involve stakeholders or, and call it an open field and let those who want to contribute come forward. Mm. But again, this needs also uh, political involvement and social involvement from the people. So many of the uh, critics who spoke about the 2030, said that this is like a, a corporation, mm. but we are a country, there yeah. are people, so there are many stakeholders involved. Mm. So uh, the um, program as it is now is mainly a top-down agenda. In other words, its, its vision is laid out at the top and then it, it affects trickle down and percolate through society, that's the idea. Is there a parallel bottom-up phenomenon going on, or is, is it really going to have to flow only in one direction? Well, in, uh, you know, fortunately or unfortunately, uh, in that part of the world, uh, the decision-making process starts from up-down. But in this case, because you have a plan, a plan needs participants, it needs people, it needs uh, partners, the partners are the people, and I yes. think you can have all these plans on paper. You can have all these bureaucrats and all these foreign companies that have come and 
given you advice and taken the due um, revenue for that, I think it's important that that plan has to come from down up too mm. and to involve people, make them feel that they are important to this plan. Mm. How would you do that? Do you have any specific suggestions? I mean, uh, is it a matter of communication? Is it a matter of giving people the tools to do that? I mean, how would, how would that work in, in a country like Saudi Arabia? It's both. It's communication. Oh. It's the government telling people, we want you to participate. We mm. want your advice to make guilds, to make... Uh, associations mm. uh, to listen to people and to bypass bureaucracy mm. because with all this thing and you've heard this before having people to come in and invest and one-stop shopping I mean if the bureaucrats don't believe in it mm. and if the people don't have the right or they don't have the vehicle for getting the viewpoint across uh, I don't think so it will work so mm. it has to be uh, a two-way solution and a two-way street so you're talking about opening, uh, significantly opening the society to um, a much more kind of broader civil society um, development here. Is it? Yes, uh, suppression will get you nowhere. Mm. I mean, unless you have a society that feels that they are stakeholders, mm. that they are participants, that they are valued people, you know, uh, they will not go. I mean, you can't rule by force. Uh, and which in this case is not happening. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they have been very good having PR programs, uh, telling the people, but all this revolves around ministries, mm -hmm. companies, corporations. I wanted to filter down where people would involve, where the man on the street would say, hey, what's gonna happen to my daughter at, in 2030? Where the businessman would say, okay, am I gonna get some more measures of uh, business freedom? Uh, these are mm -hmm. the kind of issues that uh, are needed to be yeah. looked into. Last question uh, has to do with the United States. And, and the question is, um, uh, what role can the United States play in uh, facilitating, uh, supporting, uh, making the, the uh, transformation work? And um, also, uh, what's the sort of state of U.S.-Saudi relations right now? And um, how does the transformation fit into that? So a little complicated question, but still, it's all, it all comes together, I think. Yes, I think the United States uh, can help a lot into, uh, in facilitating uh, the, the mechanics of the transformation where mm. big businesses should be given modern forms and modern methods of management where there should be information uh, exchange where they would like to come and help in and do a few things and, and try to make a business uh, practices, the modern mm. business practices and the best business practices, that per se. The other thing that the United States can do is help uh, in not setting up uh, in, uh, NGOs mm. or civil society, but help facilitate them and help move them on and advise and guide. Mm. Now saying that, I mean, we, uh, you know, are not a banana kingdom, right. but at the same time, I think we do need help in creating the society mm. which exists uh, uh, both on paper and in practice, but uh, we always need help and advice from others, mm. not only the United States. Mm. I would also opt for the Asian experience. Sure. Like, for example, we have water problem, mm. we have other issues, the environment, and I think it's important for us to see NGOs and others from around the globe to help us. So I, say, I think mm. yes, and we should not be riding on our high horse. Right. It's important that we need not only the United States, but other countries as partners to help let society grow and flourish. And what, what is the condition of U.S.-Saudi relations right now? Are they, have they been improving after a difficult patch, or is there still a long way to go? Well, I think there's a long way to go. It's like a dysfunctional hmm. marriage. <laughs> I think also the Saudis for years uh, assume, rightly or wrongly, that the United States is a friend forever. Hmm. And I have said it to both those in power and outside, that there are no permanent interests. There are, uh, there are no permanent friends or uh, enemies. There are only permanent interests. Yeah. And I give you so many examples. But the question is, we, we have come to that uh, stage a long time ago, maybe 40 years ago, mm. that the U.S. is our friend for life. They're not. The U.S. now has more interest in Asia. They would look more at Vietnam and Cambodia, where you've got an 8 to 10 percent growth rate. You don't want to look at India for geopolitical purposes. Mm. Pakistan, Iran, and all. So we should not assume rightly or wrongly that we are the only wife that they have. Mm. You know, this was unfortunately the policymakers, the total banking on the United States. Mm. And for years, this thing disturbed me and many others. You cannot mm. just 
bank on one country where your own people are getting upset. Yeah. There is a disconnect between those in power and the people. And it is very obvious through social media, through the media and others, yeah. uh, because the U.S. is viewed as, as, uh, as a power that is depriving the Palestinian people of their rights, mm. although now the Palestinian question has receded a little bit in the background. The U.S. viewed, again, rightly or wrongly, as having started ISIS and other th issues mm. and not taking part. So I don't think so. We should have all our hopes on the United States. I think we have to get our act together. Mm. We have to have uh, good governments. We have to fight against uh, extremism. I mean, this is our battle. You cannot just continue. At the same time, we have to look at the United States as an equal partner, not just buying arms from them. Mm. I'm, I'm against arming uh, countries uh, uh, without, first of all, arming the society. And here mm. I'm not talking about weapons, arming the society with tools of education, mm. with uh, rights, uh, dues. These are the kind of issues that I would rather go for. Excellent. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're most grateful.